Hello! In this video, we are going to prove the following theorem. For all real numbers x, there is a unique integer n, such that n minus 1 is less than or equal to x, which is less than n. Now, in proving this theorem, we are going to rely on the following preliminary result. For all real numbers x, if x is greater than or equal to 0, then there exists a positive integer n, such that n minus 1 is less than or equal to x, which is less than n. Now, since there exists a positive integer n, clearly there exists an integer n. So, yeah, this is what we're going to be using. And in the book that this is based off of, this fact is referred to as corollary 2.4.6. The book, by the way, is Intro to Real Analysis by Bartle and Sherbert, 4th edition. Okay, so now let's get into proving the theorem. And since we're trying to prove a statement about every real number, give me an arbitrary real number. I'll call it x. And our whole goal from here is to show that there is a unique integer that satisfies this inequality. Well, let's first prove that there exists an integer that satisfies this inequality. So we'll start with existence. Now, to prove existence, we're going to break this up into two cases. Either x is greater than or equal to zero, or x is less than zero. And in either case, we're going to show that there exists an integer that satisfies this inequality. Let's start with case one, where x is greater than or equal to zero. Now, in the case where x is greater than or equal to zero, we can apply corollary 2.4.6 to x. And so applying corollary 2.4.6, we have that there is an integer n that satisfies this inequality. So we have found an integer that satisfies this inequality, namely n. So this completes case one. Now let's move on to case two, where x is less than zero. Well then, the negative of x is greater than zero. So we can apply corollary 2.4.6 to the negative of x. Because if we take the x here to be the negative x in our proof, well yeah, the negative of x is greater than or equal to zero. So, applying corollary 2.4.6, we have that there is an integer, I'll call it p, such that p minus 1 is less than or equal to the negative x, which is less than p. But then, if we focus on this inequality, we can add x on both sides, and we get that x plus p is greater than 0. And now, let's apply corollary 2.4.6 again. We'll take the x here to be x plus p. And in doing so, well, yeah, it is true that x plus p is greater than or equal to 0. So we have that there is some integer, I'll call it q, such that q minus 1 is less than or equal to x plus p, which is less than q. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take this inequality and subtract p on all three sides. So we're going to get q minus p minus 1 is less than or equal to x, which is less than q minus p. And now we see that there exists an integer that satisfies this inequality. Namely, if we take this integer to be q minus p, well, yeah. Q minus P minus 1 is less than or equal to X, which is less than Q minus P. That's what we have right here. So we have shown that there is an integer that satisfies this inequality. And we've shown that in both cases. So no matter which one of these happens to be true, there exists an integer that satisfies this inequality. So we've completed existence. Now we want to prove uniqueness. So now, we want to show that there is only one integer that satisfies this inequality. And to do that, well, suppose we have two integers which satisfy this inequality. I'll call them n1 and n2. And our whole goal is to show that n1 is equal to n2, because that will tell us that there can only be one integer 
which satisfies this inequality. Now to start, we can see that n1 minus 1 is less than or equal to x, which is less than n2. And this tells us that n1 minus 1 must be strictly less than n2. Similarly, we see that n2 minus 1 is less than or equal to x, which is less than n1. And this tells us that n2 minus 1 must be strictly less than n1. And now if we take this inequality and add 1 on both sides, we get that n2 is less than n1 plus 1. And now, putting this together, we see that n1 minus 1 is less than n2, which is less than n1 plus 1. Now, because we're dealing with integers, this tells us that n1 must be equal to n2. And to spell out more detail, the reason why this implies n1 is equal to n2 is because, well, we have three possibilities. Either n1 equals n2, n1 is greater than n2, or n1 is less than n2. Why can't these possibly be the case? Well, if n1 is greater than n2, well, because n1 and n2 are integers, this is equivalent to saying that n1 minus 1 is greater than or equal to n2. But this contradicts the fact that n1 minus 1 is less than n2. Similarly, n1 is less than n2 implies that n1 plus 1 is less than or equal to n2. But this contradicts the fact that n2 is less than n1 plus 1. So we can't possibly have these two cases. So the only choice we're left with is that n1 is equal to n2. And this is our whole goal in proving uniqueness. So really, we gave ourselves two arbitrary integers which satisfy this inequality, and we showed that they have to be equal. So this proves uniqueness. And so putting this all together, we gave ourselves an arbitrary real number x. And first, we found that there exists an integer which satisfies this inequality. And after that, we found that there can only be one integer which satisfies this inequality. So this proves that there is a unique integer that satisfies this inequality. Since x was arbitrary, this means for all real numbers x, this is true. And that's exactly what we wanted to prove. So this completes the proof. And so, yeah, that's pretty much it for this video.